Live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering Microsoft Ignite. Brought to you by Cohesity. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of Microsoft Ignite. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, co-hosting alongside of Stu Miniman. We are joined by Frank Artali, the managing partner at Prime Foray. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE, Frank. Glad to be here. So before the cameras are rolling, we were talking about the energy of this place. You've been yeah. to many, many an Ignite, way back before it was even called Ignite. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, so this is, a, Ignite is the evolution of something that Microsoft used to call tech ed. So it was like back in, when I was at Microsoft, so even back in the 90s, we had to figure out a way to educate the technical community, and we decided to start this thing. And interestingly enough, the first one ever was here in Orlando, a much smaller venue, I think, at the, at the Swan and the Dolphin. But I've been coming to them on and off, you know, for the past 26 years or so. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you're doing now at Prime Foray. What is Prime Foray? Yeah, so we're a, a boutique and advisory consulting company and we do work with what I call ISVs, so basically someone that makes software. Uh, but we engage with folks who are at some point on a journey to cloud. And that means both from a business and technical perspective, whether they're just getting started thinking about moving products that maybe they had from on-premises uh, into a cloud platform, or maybe they're well on their way and they're really looking to just like amplify and accelerate that. And so we're a team of people that have experience from product, business development, sales and marketing, to really get those companies to the place that they want to be relative to cloud. Because as we know, cloud is still the future and, uh, and everyone wants to, wants to get there. All right, so Frank, bring us inside. Without giving away state secrets, dealing with Microsoft today is very different from the company that we grew up with of, of Windows and Office. So what's it like working with Microsoft? Give a little bit of you know, wh wh where some of the key enablers are. Yeah, yeah, so, so in the early days, um, if you think about it, right, Microsoft is always great with evangelizing to an independent software vendor around building to the platform. So back in the day, so much of the Microsoft actual market cap was dependent upon the ISVs building to the APIs. And the APIs were the sort of the lock, right? And so the ISVs were, were locked. But there never was really, let's say, a great channel program for someone that was, was an ISV. The channel programs were largely structured for people that sold stuff. And so what you're really seeing now for the first time, and this is not exclusive to Microsoft, but other cloud partners, but of course since we're at a Microsoft show, we can highlight some of the things that Microsoft is doing here. It really is, cre is creating super incentives for ISVs to come to, the, to come to the platform such that the ISVs feel like they are selling side by side, uh, side by side with Microsoft. There are some great incentives around that. They provide some great access to technology and tools, really great credits to get, on, to get onto the platform. And so they focus as much on the business, like they always, uh, more on the business now, than on the access, on the access to the technology. And to the extent that, that they can work side by side with the company in building their business, well the folks that are the business owners really like that. The tech guys always like bits and bytes wherever they can go. So describe, describe, describe how the partnership works. I mean, what is, as you are now holding hands with companies that are going through a digital transformation and some working, with, some working closely with Microsoft, some maybe just on the fringes of working with Microsoft, describe, describe how the partnership is working. Yeah, so what I would call it, I would, I'd, li I'd like to say that it's, an, it's really an, uh, in some ways an evolution of, of the way Microsoft started working with ISVs a number, a number of years ago, and so at, at the core, the way Microsoft thinks about them, thinks about the ISVs is really you know, an extension of their, of their own product line, right? So a platform is only as good as the things that, that stand atop it, right? And so if Azure is a platform, or business apps is a platform, or modern workplace is a platform, you need applications that sit uh, atop those things. And one of, I think, the, one of the key things that, that Microsoft has done has really enabled the, the ISVs to become connected with the Microsoft sales organization without having intermediaries. So when, like in a lot of ways, when you're an ISV and you go work with a larger, a larger company that you want to have a partnership with, you have to find somebody that knows somebody that's the account manager for some large account. What Microsoft has done is they've automated that once you pass through a series of hurdles and certifications, you can actually enter into a program where you're opening leads into Microsoft and, you get, and, the, and the, that partner gets connected with the Microsoft sales team on the other side. So whenever I talk to people about things that they're doing, that's what I think the ISVs are most proud of. You'll hear them say things like, well, we are in X amount of accounts together with, my, with Microsoft. And, 
you know, and, and from, from a business perspective, why ever enter into a partnership if you were not going to just to, to sell stuff? Again, you can do bits and bytes all day, it's a lot of fun for people like me, but at the end of the day, revenue has to come out the other side. And I think from a partner perspective, they've done a better than good job uh, at that. All right, so Frank, when you look back to when you were inside Microsoft, yeah. give us a little bit about how the roles have been changing as we've gone into this world of cloud and AI. Right, how the world has changed? And the roles inside of Microsoft okay. specifically to you know, fit the world. Right, right. So when, uh, so when, when I was there you know, long ago, Right, we have we were obviously it was a much you know a much smaller place, and you basically had you know inside inside the house you had you had product development, and you know outside the house you had uh, channel development, and then you had uh, and then you had direct sales, and you also had OEM sales, which was which actually is a very a very big piece of the puzzle, but the linkage, right between between sales and channel wasn't really there back then. And, and sometimes, like even the role that I had in program management, in times we had, we had, to, be, we had to be glue for that. I think what, um, the, you know, in, in a sense now, what the roles have changed in such a way that you have, you have people you know, inside the house now that are really responsible for, for not just ensuring that a, a partner feels good about what they're doing, but that, the, but that the partners are actually selling side by side with folks in the field, and that would have been you know, an impossible thing, really impossible thing to do, you know, to do at the time. Uh, and so the other thing that's, I think that's really changed is now that you have, you have an overlay sales organization called Worldwide Commercial and also a direct sales, sales organization. So direct sales organization are people that carry the bag and, and have quota right on the accounts. But then you have another organization that looks after the 500 largest accounts. And there are a lot of specialists in that organization that by definition work with partners, right, to move both the Microsoft products and the partners' products together in there. And so those are large organizations that plain and simply just, did, just didn't exist. And they may have not even made sense, you know, at the time, because at the time a lot of what we were doing in the 90s, we were still, distributed computing was still really a technical curiosity and then it became trusted infrastructure. And it's really only in the last few years that cloud computing has moved beyond that from being a technical curiosity you know, to, tr you know, to trusted infrastructure. And the way, it, the way it's taken to market is so much different because we took finished goods to market. We relied on people to carry boxes of stuff. We relied on people to do inventory. There's no more inventory. I mean, it's just there. You turn it on and you, and you go. So I think what you'll see also from, uh, again, from the way that the commerce, the commerce engines are set up and the kind of people that are deployed are really being tooled for that kind of go to market, which is significantly different. So we're really just scratching the surface when it comes to cloud. As you said, so many of these companies are, are only at the beginning of their, of their journeys. Wh what do you think the future holds in terms of trends in the marketplace and what companies are going to continue to want? And are there any blind spots that, that, you're, that you, as someone who's been in this industry for 36 yeah. years, sort of know are there? Right, so, like, so today was an interesting one to see ARC uh, announced. And, you know, and it shows a natural rev uh, evolution of the way that we think about uh, a platform. So if we go back to even like the late 80s, right, we had to build servers, right? So you got a network operating system and there was a set of network adapters and a set of hardware it worked on and you had to pay a systems integrator to go put it all together and then you kind of hope it worked. Well then we got this stuff called plug and play in the, in the early 90s and it flattened the playing field and you can take an operating system like Windows NT, the one that I worked on, and as long as it adhered to a plug and play standard, it generally worked you know, on that platform. But the operating system then grew to become a collection of services. It was a file server, it was an identity server, eventually things like transaction processing, networking was always in there. Now if you look at what something like Arc or any of the services that are available on other clouds, they're really services on, on which applications are built. So now it's just natural to see that these services, like from the cloud vendors, are being taken onto other cloud infrastructure. So today, we are here at Microsoft. You see Arc, which is a set of Azure services, which are being made available and useful on other platforms, like on-premises, as an example. Um, to me, that's no surprise for Microsoft. They kind of led the way with that, with their IoT technology, how you see Azure services moving on to there. So now, uh, from an opportunity perspective, as, a, as a, someone who's building applications, you could say, okay, I can now go look at services that I know will be available on all clouds. So I have a, let's just say I can, I can snap to that, and now I can go to my customer and also talk about a 
flexible, uh, you know, a flexible opportunity about where and why you might want to deploy. So more opportunities around that though, what gets complex? Management gets complex, security gets complex. We're sounding like the 90s again, right? Where whole industries grew up around things like performance and security, you know, and systems management uh, around that. And so I think, you know, from a, just strictly from an opportunity perspective, you know, there'll be companies here that see that and, and go take advantage of it to get out in front. And there'll be ones that are already incumbents and hang on for dear life saying things have to be different on each cloud, but I think as you see companies that embrace the notion of sets of services that will be running across clouds, those, those are where really the opportunities will be. Just like we saw you know, in, the, in the 90s, folks that said, hey, I'll run my application on Windows NT on any piece of hardware, right? They didn't tie themselves to, I'll just say like, you know, Compaq or Tandem, folks that don't exist anymore. <laughs> that, that the, uh, the folks we have here today. All right, so, so Frank, you know you can't get through an interview with theCUBE without getting a question from John Furrier. Okay, is he so, on? So, so John's been watching and he wants to know, how's the restaurant scene doing in Seattle? Okay, so uh, yeah, Seattle restaurant scene is second to none. Uh, obviously, a unique cuisine. Uh, two restaurants that I'm personally involved with, one in downtown Seattle and, uh, and one, in, uh, one in Bellevue, Washington. Both completely different cuisines, one heavy on steak, one heavy on plants. And we'd like to say we're up and to the right on both of those, John, so, so thanks for asking. Great, excellent. Well, Frank Artali, always a pleasure having you on. Thanks so much. Great, thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Microsoft Ignite.